you have me on? Yes, you do. We will call the 12th regular meeting of the Common Council to order. Sue, would you call the roll, please? Bauman? Here. Berg? Here. Bonet? Here. Serta? Here. Graf? Here. Manny? Here. Montemayor? Here. Perez? Here. Peterson? Here. Rinflesh? Here. Sigali? Here. Stefan? Excuse? Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Wangaman? Excuse? And Warner? Here. 14 present. Forms present. Alderman Warner? One minute, please. Thank you, Your Honor. I move the minutes of the last Common Council meeting of September 7th and a special meeting of September 13th uh, be approved and that the same stand is entered on the record. We have a motion before us and second that the minutes of the previous Council meeting and the special Council meeting be approved. Under discussion. Carrying none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. This evening with us we have Troop 890 from Holy Name and St. Clements and their Scoutmaster is Chris Sweeten, correct? And would the boys like to come up and uh, lead us in a pledge, please? Scout salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Triad with us this evening, Sheboygan County Wide Crime Stoppers, Neighborhoods Against Drugs, and members of the Neighborhood Watch. Did I miss it? Thank you all for being here this evening. With that, Steve, resignations. This was a letter that uh, was submitted to the Business Improvement District Manager and the Board of Directors. Uh, from James Hansen advising that uh, due to a change in his career path, he's retiring from Yonkers effective August 1, 2004, and he's tendering his resignation from the Business Improvement District Board. That can be accepted file. And uh, this is dated today's date. Hereby submit the following appointments to the Business Improvement District for your consideration. Jane Davis Wood to be considered for the unexpired term of James Hansen, whose term expires 9-16-05. And reappoint Robert Hurry, Alan Rudnick, Greg Wegeman, and Richard Granke for three-year terms to expire 9-14-07, signed by the mayor. And that will lie over. Okay. This evening we have election of the Board of Water Commissioners, Alderman Warner. I thank your honor and make a motion that nominations be received from the floor, voting to be done by open ballot, and if more than two candidates are nominated, the candidate with the lowest number of votes be dropped from the list and balloting continue until one candidate receives a majority. So we want to second that? Okay. On that, your honor, uh, I would uh, nominate Gerald R. Vandekreek to serve on a three-year term on the Board of Water Commission. Yeah, let's vote on that second first. Let's okay. vote on that. We don't need to roll, I don't think. Mm -mm. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, now Alderman Warner. Again, Your Honor, uh, thank you. Uh, it, it is an honor to nominate Gerald R. Van de Creek to serve on the Board of Water Commissioners for a three-year term. Second. Okay, we have a motion, a second before us. Are there any other nominations? Are there other, uh, any other nominations? With that, Alderman Warner. 
Uh, that, Your Honor, move that the nominations be closed and a unanimous ballot be cast for Gerald R. Vandercreek to the Board of Waterworks Commissioners. Second. A motion and second before us. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Mr. Gold here. Jerry's here. Jerry. Congratulations, <laughs> Jerry. On here, you have Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce letter. Alderman Warner. Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. This came from uh, Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, and uh, it states Mayor James Schramm and members of the Common Council, City of Sheboygan, uh, the 2004 PGA Championship was an extraordinary opportunity for the City of Sheboygan to showcase its spirit and economic vitality to thousands of visitors, patrons, sponsors, golfs, and the media. Our government leaders and personnel responded with characteristic hard work and dedication to ensure that the event would have a positive impact on visitors and on the area economy. Extraordinary cooperation to get the artistic sculptures in place, to clean the streets, to assist with placing signs, planning for traffic, getting the Mead Library Fountain operational, and with overall beautification is commendable. On behalf of the 820 business members of the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, we extend our appreciation. The positive impact of this event will resonate for years to come. The Chamber anticipates residual return visits from many who experienced this wonderful event in Sheboygan County. The City of Sheboygan presented itself with pride and class. We look forward to the 2007 U.S. Senior Open and other impending future golf opportunities such as the LPGA in 2009, the U.S. Open in 2012, and perhaps the Ryder Cup and return of the PGA. We appreciate, with ver we appreciate very much the professional commitment made by various city departments during the 2004 <coughs> PGA Championship and look forward to continued cooperation for a very bright and successful future. Yours truly, Dolores E. Olson, Executive Director, and Dennis, Dr. Dennis Ladwig, the Chairman of 2004 Chamber PGA Steering Committee. Thank you, Alderman Warner. <clears throat> I'll wait for him, Sue. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eric Etson is first. Eric, if you could come over to the mic, please. And could you give me your home address, please? 3612 Rosewood Court. Rosewood. And you will have five minutes. As part of my responsibilities as the president of the Sheboygan Professional Police Association, I attended the special meeting last Monday night called to discuss the significant budget concerns for next year. To be blunt, I left that meeting with serious questions about this, the direction that this council is taking us and the commitment to solving these issues in a responsible way. I speak for all 68 of our members when I say that as a resident, taxpayer, and employee of the city, I am appalled and angered at the triviality that surrounded that last meeting. By the council scheduling this meeting 45 minutes early and hardly asking any questions of all the department heads that were present, despite the doom and gloom scenarios presented, this group <coughs> conveyed, to us at least, that making it home in time for kickoff on the Monday Night Packer game was more important. Meanwhile, some of the officers I represent believe they won't have a job come January 1st. These are officers who have recently purchased a home in Sheboygan, moved their families here, and begun a career de dedicated to serving our community. And it doesn't help their peace of mind that every couple of days we get a new bottom line number from the mayor's office as to what we have to cut. No doubt you are faced with some serious, tough decisions. But they are decisions that have, for the most part, resulted directly from the action or inaction of this council. At the meeting last Monday, a comment was made that we should be proud that we had a 0% tax levy increase last year and have held the line on taxes over the last couple of years. And I agree, as a taxpayer, I would like to pay as little tax as necessary, trim the fat, make things run more efficiently, but cut 13 cops off the street, eliminate 11 firefighters? I'm not proud of that, and to su suggest such drastic measures is irresponsible and absurd. And I don't discount the effect that the proposed cuts would have on other city departments, but in times like these, you must prioritize. Suggesting equal cuts between emergency and non-emergency services, as has been proposed, is imprudent and borders on negligent. Emergency services, particularly law enforcement, 
are of the greatest importance to our citizens, above all else. A shortage of police manpower directly affects the safety and security of each one of us in this community. When our phone rings at the police department, we must be adequately able to respond. Our dispatchers rarely, if ever, have the opportunity to say, well, we'll try to get to that later today, or we're a little short staffed today, call back tomorrow. Because of the nature of our job, what we do for this community, it demands that we respond as quickly as possible. Ask yourself, does it really matter if the city provides all these other services that I'm used to if I don't feel safe? We as police officers are the last line of defense sometimes. We are a 24 7, 365 day a year operation. Our department handled over 44,000 complaints last year and has already gone over 53,000 complaints this year. That doesn't include the 30 some thousand follow ups that we do. When people have a problem and they don't know where else to go for help, they call the police. Whether your car breaks down on the highway or you're an elderly widow and your pilot light goes out on your furnace in the middle of January or you're a mother of two and some guy is in the street in front of your house shooting a shotgun at you trying to kill you and your kids. That actually happened, if you recall, May 18th, 2003. It was a typical busy night and I was reporting early for work because we were short staffed, everyone was busy, and non-priority calls were stacking up. <clears throat> Before I even got to headquarters, I was dispatched to that call alone. No immediate backup because everyone was busy. Thankfully, that incident resulted in the apprehension of the suspect with no injuries to civilians, but it could have been worse. Because we were short staffed, we did not have the adequate manpower to maintain a perimeter, and we are lucky that the professionalism and bravery of the few officers that were there was enough to end this unthinkable scenario. But unfortunately, these circumstances, officer safety, and ultimately public welfare are jeopardized on a daily basis when we continue to run short-staffed. Drug use and drug-related crime is on the rise. Violent crime still challenges our community, and homeland security is an ever-present concern. These are times when we should be trying to add police officers to the street, not scraping to catch up, and certainly not threatening to lay off what amounts to almost an entire shift of police officers. In closing, I urge you to prioritize city services when considering budget cuts and the impact that those cuts would have on public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Chris Damcott. Chris, could you please give me your home address? 942 Page Court in Sheboygan. 942 Page. And you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Christine Damcott. I'm here representing the public safety dispatchers for the city of Sheboygan Police Department. I'm here to speak about the budget reductions and what impact it will have on the city's dispatch center personnel. Dispatch center personnel, 85% of our budget is personnel. That means the cutting of approximately two dispatch part-time positions. The public safety communications budget has been reduced for the past three years. And in 2004, we lost one part-time position due to budget reductions and we're not able to rehire that position. It's very obvious to those, who, those of us who understand the emergency dispatch function that the loss of two additional people would totally shut down functions on the third shift and leave personnel on that shift with no relief for breaks, vacations, sick time, and emergency situations where they would have to leave work due to emergencies or family illness. Because of the shortage of personnel, supervisors would be responsible for handling the desk duties in addition to their normal workloads, and officers would also have to handle complaints on the road that are currently being handled by the desk shift personnel dispatcher. Due to these working conditions, it may also result in unwanted resignations, which would further jeopardize, jeopardize not only our operation, but also the officers on the street and the citizens of Sheboygan. This in turn could result in possible lawsuits for the city when we are unable to answer and respond in a timely fashion to a 911 call because the operator was busy doing something else or was not trained to handle the situation. There's a tremendous amount of training time and money invested in the dispatchers that we currently have employed with our department. It requires 15 weeks of full time on the job training and a full year of probation to learn the high stress jobs associated with these, with these positions. 
We cannot expect the remaining dispatchers to work double shifts with no time off under these conditions, and we certainly cannot expect the citizens of Sheboygan not to call 911 after 11 p.m. due to layoffs as there will not be enough personnel to handle the call. It is important for us to all remember that dispatchers are the first responders for all calls that come to our department for our police, fire, and EMS assistance. Dispatchers are the first link in the whole chain of preparedness and response, no matter what the emergency is, and unfortunately, we are a resource that is often taken for granted. In addition to handling all the emergencies, we must know how to operate sophisticated technology, computers, and radio systems and communicate with other police agencies. We are the first point of contact for anyone who comes to City Hall to do business, and we also handle all of the walk-in traffic, type of all reports, arrest logs, data entry, take and find money, and handle overflow calls such as 911 and on the business line. Last year, dispatchers handled 1,440 police-related complaints over the phone that would otherwise would have required an officer to handle, therefore lowering, lowering their workload. I would like to personally invite anyone to come in and sit in our center to view the, for themselves the amount of stress and workload we are under each and every day. In addition to all of the items mentioned above, our utmost priority still remains to be the safety of the, dis of the officers on the street and to the citizens of Sheboygan. And in order to accomplish this, we need to be fully staffed. There is absolutely no more room to cut in our department and yet still continue to provide the safety and services to the citizens of Sheboygan. I cannot stress enough how this would impact our department and the services we provide. If the mayor and the council are truly concerned about the public safety for the citizens of Sheboygan and the officers on the road protecting the citizens, they will need to prioritize the budget and realize that the laying off of emergency police, fire, and EMS call takers and dispatchers is a mistake that will cost them much more in the long run than in the part-time positions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mr. Frank Colksan. <clears throat> yes, sir, could you give me your home address, please? Sure. I live at uh, 2829 uh, Erie Avenue. And, and you will have five minutes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm here to um, make some comments about the Sheridan Park. Uh, I don't live near Sheridan Park, but I teach at Sheridan School. I've taught there for a good many years, and Several years ago, I also had an extended tenure there. I've gotten to know the students and their families, and I believe that the park has value to them, great value. And I can empathize with them because I grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood in Chicago. And um, I know that uh, things like a park are important when you don't have a big backyard and you don't have a lot of other recreation available to you. I um, uh, want you to know that I'm going to add something to my remarks because of what I heard from the police and the dispatcher today, that if um, you said to me, well, Frank, <coughs> if you want Sheridan Park and police service and the dispatcher, you're going to have to pay more taxes. And I'll look at you and I'll say, you know what? I'm, one of, I'm not one of those people who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. I know the value of our police department. I know the value of our dispatchers. And if you tell me that I have to pay an additional price by paying higher taxes, I'll say, so be it. I, um, I remember a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes. He said, taxes are the price you pay for living in a civilized society. My blue collar uncle said much more succinctly with a little different slant. He said, Frankie, remember this. You don't get nothing for nothing. So if I want police service and a dispatcher and Sheridan Park, tax me some more. I'll accept it because I know the value of these things. Now, um, I would like to take the next three minutes because I know exactly it's going to take three minutes to present my remarks about Sheridan. 
to lighten the evening and to get the message across, I have set this to a lively tune. And you may not agree with the lyrics, but it's a jaunty tune that might entertain you. So. Now Sheridan Park is a treasure, a gem to preserve and enjoy. Its value is clear to all people, except those councilmen who turn a blind eye. Except those councilmen who turn a blind eye. Except those councilmen who turn a blind eye. Its value is clear to all people, except those councilmen who turn a blind eye. They're blind to the green space and tall trees. They don't give a hoot for the rest. They pave over Eden with concrete and tell us that they know what's best. And tell us that they know what's best. And tell us that they know what's best. They pave over Eden with concrete and tell us that they know what's best. They focus on bottom line numbers and ignore what the neighborhood needs. Why should they most aren't going to live there? Just let the destruction proceed. Just let the destruction proceed. Just let the destruction proceed. Why should they most aren't going to live there? Just let the destruction proceed. Say, let's take all the parks and build on them. Lots of property tax we'd collect. Why shouldn't parks be subdivided when the bottom line's all you respect? When the bottom line's all you respect. The bottom line's all you respect. Why shouldn't parks be subdivided when the bottom line's all you respect? Meanwhile, Sheridan Park is a our focus. We want women, teenagers, and men to talk to their reps on the council. Let them know that they must vote again. Let them know that they must vote again. Let them know that they must vote again. Me, so sir. talk to your reps on the council. Let them that they must vote again. One more verse. The council can vote and it's reveal, fine, this is the punchline, what matters to them, but ignore what the citizens say is important. They should listen or be voted out the door. They should listen or be voted out the door. They should listen or be voted out the door. What the citizens say is important. They should listen or be voted out the door. Door. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> John Berner. <laughs> Mr. Berner, can you give me your home address? 1919 please? Broadway. I'm sorry? 1919 Broadway. 1919 School Broadway. School teacher didn't learn how to tell time, did he? <laughs> And you have five minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, I watched the Common Council meeting last week, and I listened to the department heads say how they were going to trim down their departments. <clears throat> but I yet to hear one department head say what he was going to trim for himself. I think when you trim, you kind of start at the top and work down. And for the police and fire, those are the last things you want to cut. There's, there's stuff going on in the city and it's escalating. And the cut, cut police department, fire service? I mean, you're just saying to people that are committing crimes, hey, free for all, it's, hey, just help yourself. It's, you don't cut there. And for Sheridan Park, everybody hates to see a park go. But some things have to be given up for others to benefit. And to say, well, you'd rather pay more taxes? There's a lot of people don't have that extra money to pay taxes. They don't. They live on a fixed income. 
I'm making a whole whopping 11 grand this year. I mean, my medical expenses are over a thousand a year. Taxes, 24. More taxes. That's not including the gas, electricity. Now, you can't save everything for everybody. But I think the people on fixed incomes should be allowed to live in their houses as long as they can and not because somebody wants to save something that can increase taxes. To them, the increase doesn't mean anything, but to the people that don't have it, it does mean something. Thank you. Less than five. Thank you. Uh, Penny Weber, please. Penny, can you give me your home address, please? 1712 Sunnyside Avenue. Sunnyside. And you will have five minutes. I'm Penny Weber. I'm a citizen member of Neighbors Against Drugs, and I'm also a citizen member of Sheboygan County White Crime Stoppers. I'd like to say a few words tonight about the police department and obviously specifically about the community policing unit. Neighbors Against Drugs was the idea of Todd Preby, who is one of the community um, policing officers. It has allowed citizens in this community to have a voice, to help in solving some of the problems in their neighborhood. These people thought that there wasn't any place they could turn, and yet they found that there was. There was a, a community policing officer that cared enough, went out into the community and told them, you can help, and this group of citizens can help. And we've been out in the community and done some things with getting rid of the sale of illegal drugs in neighborhoods. The other thing is that most times police are reactive. They respond to calls because there's trouble. The community policing department is proactive. It goes out and tries to find the root of the problem and then tries to come up with a solution and allows those neighbors and citizens such as myself to have a hand in doing something good. Many times you hear negative things about police departments because they remember getting stopped for a speeding ticket or whatever the case may be. But with community policing, you're out and you're showing the citizens that they're there to help. And that should be a common sense thing, but it's not necessarily so. So I would like to see community policing continue in some way to allow the citizens to continue to have a say in what happens and know that they have the power, if they band together, to do something good and to get rid of some of the things that have caused problems in the neighborhood. Now about the um, Sheboygan County White Crime Stoppers, it's a little different effort. There we actually put out a reward for people that will help solve crimes that law enforcement has hit a dead end on. And by hoping that citizens will come forward and offer information so that crimes can be solved, we're there and we fundraise and offer rewards and allow them to give information being anonymous. They don't have to worry about repercussions or anything else. And it's the same thing with Neighbors Against Drugs. When we're out in the neighborhood and we canvass and we get the information and we know that there's a problem, when we go and do something, when we put our signs out, every neighbor gets one except for the suspected drug house. So the neighbors are all looking at each other and saying, we can do this together. And I think that's very important. And I would like to see that kind of effort continue. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, no one has anything to pull ahead. Consent agenda. Everything from 12.1 through 12.29, except 12.26. First, we'll start with 12.4. 12.4 will lie over until October 18. 12.26, 12.26, we will hold. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe that was the only yeah. two. Yeah. Okay. okay. Alderman Warner. I think uh, I just would like to mention on 1226, the reason that's being held is there is a possibility that Homeland Security grant funds might be able to cover the city's cost in this, and that is being looked into, so we're hoping that that does come through. Save $32,000, $35 if it does come to fruition. So. On that, Your Honor, I would move that all our oaths be accepted and placed on file, all our C's be accepted and adopted, and all resolutions, substitute resolutions, and ordinances be passed. Second. Moved and seconded that all our oaths be accepted and filed, our C's accepted and adopted, resolutions and ordinance be put upon their passing. 12 1 through 12 29, under discussion, Alderman Vanderwill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, could I pull 12 28, RC by Public Works? I'd just like an explanation of the in intention of this uh, report to committee. Alderman Bauman, or do you want Tom Holton? I'll defer to uh, Tom Holton. Uh, this is for a uh, schematic design for a pedestrian bridge over the Sheboygan River. Uh, to serve South Pier, and uh, there's money that was approved in the capital improvements program for this year of $35,000. We're looking for a design uh, so we can go out and apply for federal grants uh, to try to get that bridge constructed. We need to know if it's feasible to build, what will work, uh, before we can ask those questions, ask to get the grant monies. Uh, as of now, do we know how much that study will cost? $35,000. For the study? Yep. Okay. I would ask for a separate vote on this. Okay. If we'll do that first. Alderman Perez on 12.28. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I didn't quite catch. How much was it cost? 35000 35000 Yes. Where is that money coming from? Out of TIF 6. TIF 6? Yes. You want a separate vote on 1228? Yes, sir. Okay, let's do that first. On 1228, would you call the roll, please? Okay. Um, Bauman? Aye. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? No. Peterson? No. Rinflesh? Aye. Sigali? Aye. Van Akron? No. Vanderweel? No. And Warner? Aye. Okay. Ten eyes, four no's. Alderman Warner on 1227, <coughs> by Public Protection Safety recommend an entrance of contract to purchase a truck rescue body for the Fire Department rescue vehicle. Does that go along with 1226? It doesn't. No. <coughs> Okay, if there's no other questions on the consent agenda, would you call the roll, please? Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Rinflesh. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. And Bauman. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1230 through 1233 to be referred. 1234 can be accepted and placed on file. <clears throat> Alderman Warner? Oh, excuse me, Alderman Bonnie. I was going to, since I'm the vice chairman of that committee, I thought. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to accept and file the report of officer. Second. We'll be second to accept and file the report of the committee. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carried. 1235 through 1240 to be referred. 1241 by Alderman Groff, increasing the purchase of land in the Sheboygan Business Center and deleting one of the <coughs> selling policies. Alderman Groff. Yeah, and I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Move and second that the resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. 
Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Alderman Bonet, Vanderwill, Serta. Oh, back up. Alderman Bonet. No, 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 oh, okay. No, Got a little ahead here. Okay, repealing a recreating substitute of a resolution which in establishes a period in which the Common Council meeting meeting whereby people are allowed to speak on any subject relevant to city government. Okay, Alderman Bonet. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to make a motion that the resolution be put upon its passage. It's moved and second the resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 1243 by Alderman McGraw, Stephen Berg, Manny, and Montanier. Amending the debt policy for the city's limit on the annual debt insurance up to three million per year for non-TIF projects. Alderman Groff. Yeah, and I would move that that resolution be put upon its passage. Let's move to second that the resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. And under discussion, uh, just so that everybody's aware of it, um, a positive vote on this would mean that the debt that to be issued for the police facility um, for eight point eight million in two thousand six and the debt for City Hall remodeling at four million two in 2008 would not come into play when we're talking about a limit of $3 million on our capital borrowings. Is there any other discussion? Alderman Segali. Do I understand you right where you're saying the police station's not gonna be built or not thinking of being built until 2006? That's when the borrowing takes place, in 2006. Okay, so we have to wait until that time. Then. Well, I believe there's funds available in 2005 to start some preliminary work, uh, but the majority of it will be in 2006, that is correct. Okay. Alderman Warner? No? No, that's right. Okay. Would you call the roll, please? Serta. Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. <clears throat> Perez, Aye. Peterson, Winflesh, Sagali, Aye. Van Akron, Aye. Vanderweel, Aye. Warner, Aye. Bauman, Aye. Berg, Aye. and Bonet. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried 1244 will lie over. 1245 through 1249 to be referred. 1250 by law and licensing recommending denying Class B fermented beverage license and Class 3 wine license 2278 based upon the applicant's previous record of violation and the committee standards for issuing the license. Alderman Bonet. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to motion and accept and adopt the report of the committee. Second. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Under discussion, I'd like to request if uh, Jose Hernandez is present. We need a motion to open the floor to his second. Okay, we have a motion before us and a second under discussion. <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Uh, as I just mentioned, my client is Jose Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Hernandez is here tonight and is actually in the back and will speak in a moment to you. Uh, but I guess I'd like to start by explaining a little bit uh, about Mr. Hernandez. Uh, he came before the Law and Licensing Committee, and uh, tonight you've heard they'll recommend to deny his application. However, Mr. Hernandez feels he retained an attorney, I think, kind of to uh, make sure that his best foot is put forward in this. He, after meeting with the committee, he doesn't feel like he, I don't want to say understood, but he didn't, he didn't know what the committee wanted, and he, he doesn't feel like he did a good job of presenting it. So I'm taking this opportunity tonight to try to rectify any of those concerns the committee may have had, and also to allow a, an opportunity to Mr. Hernandez to speak to the full council. Uh, Mr. Hernandez was a over 20 year employee of Planko. Uh, he retired about two years ago. He has been bartending since, and now would like to open an establishment at uh, 1015 South 10th Street uh, by the name of Escandalo. Uh, his establishment would cater largely to the growing Hispanic population in Sheboygan. 
and he has invested substantial amounts of time and resources already in this venture. He's signed a year lease for the premises and seeks to open the business as soon as possible if he's able to obtain the license he has applied for. Uh, after meeting with the committee, it's Mr. Hernandez's understanding that they have two concerns. Uh, one, he did receive a citation over a year ago for uh, serving minors. Now this requires, this is a long and somewhat convoluted story, but it requires at least a little bit of explanation. Uh, he was a bartender being employed as a bartender, and the police did indeed find minors drinking in an establishment. Uh, Mr. Hernandez did not serve the minors, however, he was there and took responsibility for the serving of the minors and accepts that responsibility today. He has not yet paid the fine in that matter. It was his understanding his employer at the time said they were going to pay the fine. They have not. And Mr. Hernandez has contacted the court in an effort to set up a payment plan as it's a substantial fine, I think, of roughly $800. Uh, addressing any concerns with his new establishment, Mr. Hernandez wants to make sure nothing like that would occur. He proposes that he would have a bouncer at the door, essentially to check IDs and stop any problems before they even enter the establishment. In addition, it's my understanding that the committee has another concern, that uh, a few warnings were issued for an establishment that Mr. Hernandez worked at as a bartender being open too late. Again, Mr. Hernandez acknowledges responsibility, uh, perhaps a misunderstanding of the law, at least for the first violation, and again, uh, pleads with the council that he's willing to work with law enforcement, learn the laws of the city, and seeks only to, to open an establishment that uh, is free and void of any of the problems or mistakes that were made in the past. He just, he really seeks the council to have an open mind on this. He, in fact, he's instructed me to take a proactive approach to try to help him understand the laws, help him comply with law enforcement, and I, I did that starting today. I contacted it's interesting that Neighbors Against Drugs is here tonight. I had contacted uh, some law enforcement officers from Neighbors Against Drugs in an effort to help Mr. Hernandez develop some policies to make sure that none of that element would be in any establishment that he would open. Uh, he's agreed and he would like to, in fact, meet with people from Neighbors Against Drugs to help him along in that effort and whatever he can do and their help would be appreciated. In addition to that safeguard, Mr. Hernandez also will be posting signs in the establishment indicating that any unlawful activity or serving of minors or anything is prohibited and in fact he'll immediately call law enforcement. It's often said, I think, by law enforcement that that's one of the best ways to keep a lawfully run establishment is to send that message that in fact laws will be complied with and those who don't comply with them, we don't want them in our establishment. I think really what Mr. Hernandez is here tonight to do is to look for an opportunity to, to be given a chance to show the council, the city, law enforcement, everyone that he can run a good establishment which uh, caters to the population as a whole and specifically the Hispanic population and an establishment which will comply with the laws and work with law enforcement and do the best it can. I would like to give Mr. Hernandez an opportunity to briefly address the council and any questions, but before I do that, if anyone has any questions for me at all, I'd be happy to entertain any questions at all. Or any discussion from anyone on the Law and Licensing Committee which has possibly additional questions that weren't answered tonight or uh, would like something. Excuse me, sir, Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first, I will ask Steve how much I can share with some of the things that were discussed in that um, committee, because due to Mr. Hernandez's reputation, is. Is there any restraints as far as talking and discussing? Okay, I just wanted to make sure for Mr. Hernandez. Um, this was not the first time he was present in front of law and licensing. So number one, he did have a past history of violations that he was um, doing while being a bartender. And there was actually more to the story about what was said. I made sure that I specifically asked Mr. Hernandez because when he explained the situation about the citation he received, he was on the premises not working and there was a gentleman who was serving at that time who did not have a license to serve alcohol and had served the minors. And Mr. Hernandez took it upon himself to jump behind the bar and take responsibility to help that other gentleman. And I use the word help because those were the exact words that Mr. Hernandez had said. I helped that gentleman. I helped that gentleman. And when I asked Mr. Hernandez, do you feel that you helped him even though you had broken the law? And in his mind, he was helping him. And I explained that 
him now asking to be the owner of the bar, how much more of a responsibility in setting a precedent and being law abiding and that I had a hard time with under believing that he would be able to follow that out. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Montemayor, you had your light on before. Do you uh, still want to speak? Uh, no, uh, long past. Thank you. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mayor. I just <clears throat> have a question for uh, Mr. Hernandez, this is an attorney. Is it your impression, I, I seem to, to get a feel that perhaps Mr. Hernandez needed a translator during that time, that he wasn't able to understand some of the, what was happening during that meeting? I, I think a translator may have been helpful, and I, I think at the very least, he just didn't grasp completely what he was being asked and what was being asked of him. Um, a translator or possibly someone else there to assist him in, in directing him, because I, I, I do agree, I don't think he completely grasped what the committee was trying to ask him and what, what he might uh, provide to the committee. Okay, thank you. And if, if I get a... Oh, go ahead, hang on a minute. Uh, question, uh, Attorney Rosemius, uh, before you go. Uh, Mr. Hernandez's uh, address, I know we, uh, our office sent out certified mail uh, dated September 15th to Mr. Hernandez at 334 Forest Boulevard in Sheboygan Falls, and it, it came back undelivered. And uh, with, with the forwarding address, because we request a return receipt, and uh, came back with a Laredo, Texas address. So I'd like to, like to know what your client's address is. Uh, Mr. Hernandez actually moved to Sheboygan in, in hopes of being closer to the establishment and running it. Uh, Laredo, Texas, I, I guess you can address that with him, but it's my understanding he's moved to Sheboygan. I don't have the address in front of me, but certainly he will provide it. He's currently renting in Sheboygan, uh, trying to be closer to his place of business. One thing you could, uh, Mr. Hernandez should be aware of, and uh, you as his counsel should advise him, uh, it's important uh, when applying for licenses and if you have a license to, uh, to keep the city and the, through the clerk's office informed of any change of address. Uh, uh, it's particularly helpful if we need to contact the owner of the establishment that we can track them down. Absolutely. And Excuse me, sir. Alderman Berg, you have another question? Thank you, Your Honor. Didn't you say he worked at Plastics Engineering? He works at Planko for Planko uh, roughly for 20 25 years. years and retired from there and is now retired and uh, bartending and hoping to open this business. So he did work at Planko for about 25 years. And to go back and address that, uh, the, the comment or the, the statement re regarding the helping of the other employee, that, that is an accurate rendition of what occurred and why Mr. Hernandez received uh, the citation. Indeed, he wasn't working at the time, and apparently the owner of the establishment had put on shift a bartender without a, without a license. Mr. Hernandez uh, was in the establishment. He did work there, but wasn't working at the time and did take responsibility. He understands, and will explain to you more than anyone, the mistake in what he did. At the time, I think, I think he viewed it as something that had to be done. There was no one else there to take responsibility, and he stepped up and did so. That being said, he'll, he'll tell you today, I'm sure, that that was a mistake. And he is really, and sincerely, from talking to him, I can tell you, he is really and sincerely interested in working with law enforcement not only to help educate him, but to provide him the tools to have a, a safe and lawful establishment. Okay, Mr. Hernandez. <coughs> can you pull the microphone down a little bit so we can hear you? Thank you. My name is Jose C. Hernandez, Jr. Uh, I just come here to see if uh, they can pass for uh, a beer and wine license to run a, a bar on 1015 South 10th. And uh, what the lawyer said is the same thing I was going to say. The only thing I say is, uh, it's nice to have a, a Mexican bar because most Mexicans live around here in the south side. If they no, had no Mexican bar, they go to other bars, and you know the people, how they are, you know. They start talking about them and all that. That's why I just want to see 
they can give me a license, uh, put a part for them, and then they only can come where the bar is, you know, Mexican bar. I know that uh, when I was working there, the, the bar was so screwed up and all that about drugs and all that. And uh, what I was going to do is change everything if, we, if, I, took, if I took over the, the bar. There will be, like the lawyer said, I can put signs in, in, the, in the front of the bar for saying that uh, for drugs, if they want no drugs here. And I can have uh, some bouncers in the door checking for their IDs. And uh, because uh, there, there's only two persons allowed to go to the bathroom. If uh, I'm going uh, to start Tell them if they see three or four going to the bathroom, or five, tell them no, just two persons can go in the bathroom. And, uh, and all this, the address that you got here for Laredo, Texas and all that, I was over there because my mother was sick. That's why. That's why I call over here in the <coughs> office by the, I talk to the Kale or whatever, remember I call them. I was in Texas for that. My mother's not younger anymore. She's like 87, and uh, she's still. And I got other brothers and sisters. They don't want to help her anything. And I'm the oldest. I, I got to do everything for her. So just clarify, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but so your current address is 330 Forest Boulevard and Sheboygan Falls? No, I'm going to be moving to another place. That's okay. where I, my, my ex-wife lived there. All right, well, where do you live now? I'm going to be moving to uh, Encore. Uh, number I guess not, not where you're going to be moving, but where are you living now? I'm going to be staying here in Sheboygan. Excuse me? I'm going to be staying in Sheboygan. And... Uh, and see what happened if they give me the license. And I can work with the, like, the people here with the drugs and all that. I can work with the officer that they can give me idea how to fight that in there. And, uh... I'll go ahead, Your Honor, given the, uh, the circumstances and and um, I guess I'm bothered by um, by what I by what I see uh, a lack of proceedings and the severity of this case and the fact that it wasn't represented by counsel then and um, the fact that I think the counsel can make better use of its time uh, by referring it back to uh, law and licensing committee and and handling this a little a little better carefully uh, perhaps with his attorney present, perhaps with a translator present. I want to try to be as fair as I possibly can with, with everyone. I make a motion to refer it back to Law and Licensing Committee so we can move on. Second. Yeah, a second to refer it back to Law and Licensing Committee. There's lights on. Are we speaking on a motion now? Speaking on a motion? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, I am bothered by the fact that Alderman Perez, who voted to not give this license to this individual, mm -hmm. is wanting to refer it back to committee because it was unanimously voted on by the committee. We reviewed it, as did public protection safety in a prior situation, and I will not support going back to committee. I think it should be referred to or stay here in the Common Council. Alderman Warren, you had your light on on a referral, or is that what you're speaking? Yes. Okay. Right, and I guess that's the question I wanted to know is what the committee vote was. I did look for the minutes and they weren't out yet from the previous meeting. Uh, we've had these situations arise before, and after a person is guilty of multiple violations, they often come forward and say, you know, I didn't really mean it, I couldn't help it, and things like that. And, and in that committee, most people listen to all the facts, all the details that are out there provided by the city attorney office, city attorney's office. They read all the reports. The people on a committee know what happened completely and entirely. And 
they don't take their work lightly and recommend denying a license to someone when, when it's their livelihood that they're talking about. In this case, I think after having chaired the licensing <coughs> committee for a number of years, prior to the law and licensing committee come forward, I can tell you that when they make these decisions, it's not taken lightly. And I think we should support the committee's decision. I think that should things change, and, and after a while, like we did with a young lady some time back, I think it was about a year ago, we told her come back in six months or a year if you have no more violations, and we'll reconsider that. Um, every case is somewhat different, but the committee really does its work here, and it's all based on, on the city municipal code and on state code regarding liquor and licenses, and I think that uh, we should support that. So I will not vote to refer it back. Okay, hang on. Uh, are we speaking all on a referral? Oh, Alderman Vanderbilt. Thank you, Your Honor. I agree with Alderman Warner. Being on the law and license feature of PPNS, we have seen Mr. Hernandez. One question has been asked tonight that I don't think we've got an answer yet. Mr. Hernandez, where do you live? I live in Ann's Court. Ann Court? Yes. Could you I give... I'm going to be moving there. Do you have a mailing address right now if we need to contact you? Well, you can uh, send it to my ex-wife. They always get my mail, and I always go by her and get uh, pick up the mail for now. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Did I hear correctly that the citation was over a year ago? Yes. And I've heard committee members say here more than once, come back in six months. If your record is clean, try again. Well, this has evidently been more than 12 months. That's all I needed to say. Thank you. Alderman Serta, did you want to speak on... Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Honor. I think it's just important to be said that I take my position in law and licensing very seriously, as I would every I would think everybody else there does it as well. To question how we had arrived at that decision, um, given the information that was given to us at that time and at that presence, I think we came to a fair decision. And when something like this happens after the fact, and then to question our motives. I think it was that we, we did, we were fair in the beginning. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have no problem with admitting that I voted uh, to deny Mr. Hernandez's license. Uh, what I'm simply saying is that we do have new information. We do have a lack of communication, misunderstanding. I don't think he still understands where he lives or what he's supposed to tell us. But I guarantee you if I ask him in Spanish, he will. I'm not going to do that because it would be disrespectful. The other factor that's important to note here is that he was not represented by counsel. Granted, that was his choice, but he is now. All I'm saying is let's be as fair as we can to everybody who applies. We're talking about a man's livelihood here who uh, stands to lose quite a bit. If it stays clean, he's got a plan in place from what I can hear. All these things he can tell the license committee, which is what everybody has an opportunity to tell us. I think we should give him a chance to come before the, before the Law and Licensing Committee. What's wrong with that? We'll bring it back if that's the case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Groff. Thank you. I have a question regarding um, the, I haven't been on Law and Licensing for a long, long time, but what is, a, is there a time frame that, that um, normally they disregard after so many months or a year or something? Any past violations? It is 10 years. I think we should address that to Alderman Bonet, perhaps to discuss the policies of the committee. And that would just be you know, a committee policy. It wouldn't be right. statutory requirements or anything like that. Thank you. It is my turn to talk also. It's your turn okay. to talk also. Okay. Um, it, that's up to the prog of the committee. We take it on a case by case scenario for each individual case, but I believe they fall off the record as far as what we can see after 10 years. A um, couple points that were brought up, which I thought were critical, something Alderman Perez pointed out. He did have the check, he did have the opportunity. He is cognitive of what is happening here. Um, he seen, uh, as far as having counsel at our meeting, we, we had every chance, just as Alderman Perez brought a lawyer in when he had to address the issues concerning ethical um, questions. 
um, as far as translator is concerned. No, it's not out of order because I'm bringing up something instance where we had lawyers come into our. Refer to me about any. Okay. Okay. Um, another issue concerning this is translators. Uh, the, I, I forget. I apologize. I don't remember your name. It's okay. Uh, Tony Rizzini. Uh, Tony referred this morning in a, in a conversation. He contacted me as a chairman of this committee that um, he felt that he did have a good understanding of English and. It, he, he did feel that he, he did have some confusion, but the fact is he does under, did understand the proceedings of the committee. So, and that's in a conversation with the, his counsel. Um, he was able to have counsel at the meeting, hence I don't see any reason to send it back to committee as I stated before. Sir? Uh, if I might address that, I did speak with Alderman Bonet today and I, I agree. I think he understood the general purpose of why the proceeding. He understands English. It sometimes it's hard, difficult to explain, but sometimes I think it's there's a difference between understanding English and being able to present what you want to present and being able to respond to questions ad adequately. I mentioned confusion to Al Alderman Bonet because I think, it, as you can see, there occasionally when a question is posed, it's not there's something lost. And what's lost is often what is being asked and what he needs to present. Uh, we're not asking, we're asking for an opportunity for him to present it again before the committee, which I think would be harmful to no one. I, I think it would just be an opportunity for him to present to the committee and give a full presentation of what uh, he would like to do. So and, and I, he would greatly appreciate that opportunity as he is uh, working towards a plan, as you've seen here, and is better able to articulate it with the help of either a translator or myself or some other assistance. Thank you, sir. Okay, Alderman Vanderwill, and then we'll go. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to say, bottom line, he served minors. It's not the first time. And serving minors is just unacceptable. We can't stand for it again and again and again. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Alderman Manning. Thank you, Your Honor. I am on law and licensing, but was out of town for this meeting where uh, this was considered. And uh, I do have a question I would like to pursue, and I would not uh, like to pursue that this evening. I would like to see it referred. Uh, I think I would also question the previous violations that uh, Alderman Vanderweel has referred to. I'd like to see how far back they are, and uh, I'd like to entertain it again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Warner. I thank Your Honor. I guess I just wanted to confirm there were multiple vi violations. It's not just one incident. So. Yeah, last time, Alderman Boney. Oh, thank you. I, I just wanted to answer Alderman Manny's question. The incident, uh, most recent incident where he served two underage drinkers was on April 10th of 2003, so it was last year. Go ahead. I just wanted to address one concern. There's one incident of serving minors. There are two minors involved. He was charged with both of them. This happened on one occasion, it is my understanding. I don't believe he was represented by counsel in that instance either. Otherwise, we can imagine there may be a different result on that as well. But just to clarify, there was one, I believe, one incident in which two minors were involved. Thank you. Would you call the roll? <clears throat> on this is on a referral back. Everybody understand that this is referred referral back to back. law and licensing? OK. Um, Graf. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Rinflesh. Sagali. Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Warner? No. Bauman? Aye. Berg? No. Bonet? No. Serta? No. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine eyes, five no's. It's referred. It's referred back. Okay. So, sir, so it's going back to committee. It's going back to law and licensing. Law and licensing, so we understand. And I will contact City Hall tomorrow morning with uh, the correct address so you can send it all directly to me or to him, whatever the city's choose. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 1251 and 52 will lie over. 53 to be referred. 1174, I believe, will be held, correct? Alderman Warner. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move to hold. 
We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 1149 by Alderman Groff, Manny, Berg, Montemere authorizing a transfer of funds in the 2004 budget establishing estimate revenue and appropriations for a donation received to purchase items for honor guard precipitation in parades. Alderman Groff. That the resolution be put upon its passage. Move to second that resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. P uh, Perez. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Rinflesh. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Van Akron. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. And Graf. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1166, general ordinance by Alderman Warner relating to no parking area so as to add both sides of Black Walnut Trail from Georgia Avenue to a point 300 feet south thereof. Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I move the general ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Moved and second the ordinance be put upon its passage under discussion. Under discussion, uh, your honor, Black Walnut Trail is in the condo association and, and this will take care of parking problems in the beginning of their street into a depth of 300 feet. And uh, public protection recommends passage. Okay, we have a motion and a second before us. If there's no other discussion, would you call the roll? Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Rinflesh. Aye. Sagali. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Bonet. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. And Manny. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carried. 1254 will go to public protection and safety. 1255, public protection and safety. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 1254, sure, um, referred. 1255, I make a motion that it simply be filed, and perhaps the gentleman could resubmit the letter with a little better language. Second. We have a motion before us and a second to file this one. Yes. Uh, 1255. 1255? Yes. 1255. Under discussion, Alderman Warner. Under discussion, Your Honor, I have not read the letter yet, and I guess to me as a member of the Common Council, if a person submits something to me uh, and it's sent to my committee, I expect to address it in that committee. Without reading this letter, uh, perhaps I should, but in my mind, if the letter is sent to, sent to the committee, it should be sent there as they sent it. Uh. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Vanderwill. Huh? Thank you, Your Honor. I agree, Alderman Warner, that if they send a letter, they should send a letter. But if you read the letter, there's language that is used that is disrespectful. That if you're writing a letter to the city, you should not be using that kind of language. So that is my reason. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. I guess just to parrot what Alderman Vanderwiggly has said, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever having uh, that type of communication referred to uh, the appropriate committee, but obscene language as, you, as it was used uh, is uh, unacceptable. And uh, I'm all for the uh, gentleman uh, rewriting his letter, addressing the same concerns in better language, and by all means, it will be referred. Alderman Warner. I thank you, Your Honor. You know, uh, as Alderman Vanderwiggly is my vice chairman, on this one, I, I did not read the letter, and I never do read the ones that are referred to committee because I have enough to read the ones we have to actually act on. Uh, seeing the words that are in here and, and things, I think it probably could be changed somewhat, and uh, I would encourage him to do so. so. Okay, we have a motion before us to refer this. No, no. to file this. To file it. If there's another discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 1256 will go to Public Works. Alderman Franklin. Um, did we do something with 1254? Did we do something with 1254? Did that get referred? Probably protection and safety. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 1255. Okay. 1256 goes to Public Works. Other matters, Steve? 1257 is a communication from Renee Susha, 303 St. Clair Avenue, regarding room tax money. 
That will go to Special Committee on Risk Management. Alderman Perez, you want to say just, something? Just a quick question, uh, Your Honor, uh, perhaps addressed to uh, Attorney McLean. Has, uh, has any effort been made by anybody to perhaps discuss al alternatives to litigation? Uh, yes, and uh, there, there may be further discussions before the judge rules on the summary judgment motion. Okay, thank you. Alderman Mark, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Steve, uh, Attorney McLean, is there any chance that the judge might rule against um, paying for the conference center? Any chance? Yeah. Or yes. what are the chances? Yes. With, and then that we can't be paid with room tax money, that's what I mean. Yes, that's, that's what uh, they're arguing in their complaint, that can't use room tax money from the uh, uh, convention center, from the Blue Harbor Resort to pay for the convention center. What is the difference between the convention center word and the conference center word? Uh, you'd have to ask them. I don't think there's any difference myself. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, the plaintiffs apparently think that there's a distinction there that uh, has legal significance. I think in any event, uh, spending room tax dollars for debt service on a convention center or conference center, whatever you want to call it, is promoting tourism. It's tourism promotion and development. Uh, whether it's, you know, that's, that's my assessment of it. Okay, that one goes to Special Committee on Risk Management. 1258 is a communication from Marion Dion, 3307 South 12th Street, regarding her concerns with reducing the Sheboygan Police Department staffing. Public protection and safety. 1259 is a, an RO by the mayor submitting an update on the status of the 2005 budget. That one will go to finance. 1260 is an RO by the Deputy Director of Public Works and Engineering submitting the RFP tabulations for the solid waste and recycling material transfer and tipping services five-year contract comparisons. That one will go to Public Works. 1261 is a resolution authorizing entering into contract with Waste Management Green Bay, Northern Wisconsin for the solid waste and recycling material transfer and tipping services starting January 1, 2005 through December 31, uh, 2009 per the requirements under the request for proposal developed by the Department of Public Works. Public Works. 1262 is a communication from Edward Kaminsky Jr. expressing his concerns with cutting the police department staffing and stating issues regarding the issues of building a fifth fire station. Public protection and safety. It's moved and second to adjourn under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried.